believed in staying forever students. And I think the ability to learn is your ability to progress. And if Love you that. don't, if you don't, if you don't learn and you don't come in as a student, um, how can you learn? There's definitely a mental health aspect where you're sort of like, woe is me or like, why has this happened to me? Cause I, I, you know, I didn't know why I'd sort of suddenly developed this sort of condition out of nowhere. I can agree with you more. You have to focus on what you really want. What's your purpose in life? Mm. What brings you joy? What brings you fulfillment? All of those things to me are easy questions to answer. I think there was a, a period where people were trying to stress too much like optimal, but then actually what's optimal for one person is not necessarily optimal for another. So purpose, because purpose gives you fulfillment. Mm. You know, when you have a purpose, you know, in life, it gives you fulfillment, an element of fulfillment, you know, when you have a purpose in life. I remember and just like, and it's, it's, it's actually like, it taught me a lot because when I, when I was then researching, like, again, the, the sort of complexities of weight loss and understanding why people fail and why, why weight loss stalls and stuff like that, and the sort of defense mechanisms that are within the body. Mm. I was like reading the research. And I was like, I literally experienced that when I was dieting for yeah. my show. It's like important it, that, you know, I put myself in this environment, you know, mm. I choose to live my life this way. Yeah. And like I always say, the choices that you make is your decisions. So, and I think I do everything with a smile on my face because again, I'm doing the things that I love. Like, look, you know, I'm earning money from being an online coach. It would be to focus on the s small changes uh, and maintaining those changes over time. Like rather, don't try and do a big overhaul. Hey, like, you know, I think it's important like never judge a book by its cover. I mean, that's well, one of the things, one of the lessons that I've learned in life is I never judge a book by its cover. Um, I think for a long time, I didn't want to admit that I was dealing with mental health issues, which was probably the biggest mistake. <laughs>
for work. I mean, that's got to be one of the main goals in life is to be able to, you know, work takes up such a big part of your life, I guess, to enjoy it is such a, an amazing thing. So I think just combining what I was passionate about into a career and and that's also why i kept uh, doing more and more qualifications and always i'm always learning and furthering my knowledge was sort of it's why i enjoy it. it's what i'm passionate about and a bit like you you know even on my days off i'll probably go into the gym and train because it's not something i just do because i know i have to it's something i love it's amazing so with crohn's disease just for the audience out there that don't understand how it affects the human body can you just break it down and give them a simple explanation so in regards to crohn's disease yeah so crohn's disease is a autoimmune condition and it stands for inflammatory bowel disease so ibd um, mm. so you've got crohn's disease or you've got ulcerative colitis which are the two main ones uh, essentially autoimmune condition so it's your body sort of attacking itself as it were so an overactive immune system um Crohn's can look different for different people so it can affect you anywhere from sort of mouth to anus as it were so the whole digestive tract um, and that usually comes um, in the sort of you get a sort of increased inflammation in an area leading to sort of digestive issues potentially skin health issues um, sort of uh, depressive symptoms even so it, it has a whole host of sort of knock on it effects um, diet plays a big role in helping manage it now you know depending on the person it can sort of you know they may need to turn to sort of different um medications like immunosuppressants and stuff like that um i think i've been lucky enough touchwood to manage uh manage it predominantly through lifestyle i had a good gastroenterologist team when i first got diagnosed mm. that really helped me understand what i needed to do uh but yeah essentially autoimmune condition so similar to like other things like uh, rheumatoid arthritis um and, and things like that where it's the immune system attacking self so that's obviously what's led you to the passion for nutrition understanding the benefits of what we actually put into our body and how it affects the body in a positive or negative way so would you say the 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 crohn's disease that you had or you got diagnosed with led you to the path of wanting to find out more information about nutrition yeah 100 exercising so you can actually help others as well along yourself as well as helping yourself yeah i think um it definitely fueled a sort of fire in me to understand just how health works from a fundamental level and how what we put into our bodies has a knock-on effect to everything like whether it's you know exercise performance or whether it's just cognitive function or whether it's just your overall health um and i think obviously i think it there was a personal level of like i want to help myself and then that garnered a sort of like well uh, why don't i help other people as well understand this condition and how to you know manage this illness um so it, it definitely furthered a sort of not only self selfish reason to want to you know make sure i stayed healthy but also i guess selfless in terms of wanting to help other people as a result as well that's amazing so what are the biggest challenges you faced along the way then have you overcome those challenges in regards to obviously being diagnosed with crohn's mm -hmm. disease having to find out all the information that you found out to try and obviously help yourself and also help others along the way so what are the biggest challenges you faced great question um i think at the start it was a case of <sighs> there's definitely a mental health aspect where you're sort of like woe is me or like why has this happened to me because I, I you know i didn't know why i'd sort of suddenly developed this sort of condition out of nowhere and it was sort of at the end of first year of university so i've got a sort of a point in your life where you're quite susceptible to i guess sort of um you know what caring what other people think of you mm. um so i think there was a definitely a mental aspect that was one of the biggest struggles i dealt with also like you know in terms of like inflammatory bowel disease quite a lot of it is toiletry based stuff which is quite a you know an insecure issue <laughs> as understandably so but um that is at a time where you know you're coming into your own own sexually as well so like i think it was a big sort of my confidence was hit my sort of mental health was hit and we know that you know gut gut health has an immediate impact on uh, mental health as mm -hmm. well um so i think like one of the biggest obstacles was my mental health and getting sort of 
not only coming to terms with the condition, but also coming to terms with uh, potential limitations um, and potential like change alterations I needed to make in my life in order to improve it. Because obviously, like if you look at the average 19 year old or 20 year old at university, what are they doing? They're drinking a lot. They're going out. They're being social. For someone who's got a dodgy stomach. Um, alcohol is one of the worst things and also being in a social environment when you might you know have diarrhea or something mm. is quite a quite a thing to be like you know it, it created a lot more sort of like um nerves around social environments so i think it definitely it changed my personality as well and i think it changed how i look at things um but i definitely think the mental health aspect was one of the biggest things i had to overcome um and it took a while that's interesting because mm. I think obviously as a man for me I think mental health is one of the things that I definitely must touch on because you mentioned the mental health aspects of things so what are the sort of things you did to help you overcome the mental health the mental health aspects of your circumstances and obviously you felt sorry for yourself mm. that's always the first thing why me you know obviously you told on the knockoff impact that you had on your mental health so what are the sort of the the, the, the tools that you use and the things that you did to help you overcome that what sort of help did you source so um i think for a long time i didn't want to admit that i was dealing with mental health issues which was probably the biggest mistake mm. so i would advise anyone in that position if they've just been recently diagnosed or is suffering with any health issue um speaking to you know a psychiatrist or um, a therapist is invaluable so um i did recently go to therapy um just for other reasons but I, I found that very helpful um i think for me personally what's helped me the most was one i actually think exercise really helped me um not only manage my condition from like the flare-ups but it also helped give me confidence i think you know there's a lot of you can create confidence by just building more self-esteem and more sort of you know how you feel within your skin um and I think it's very empowering, getting stronger, getting more muscular. I think there's an element of it building confidence. I think mm. the other part is, obviously the more I learned about the sort of link between gut health and sort of mental health and improvements in mental health, I was able to, you know, better, you know, feed my body the nutrients it need, needed to help not only help heal the gut, and therefore help you know my own body's sort of production of things like dopamine which is you know again helps with mental health so mm. i think i i the nutrition played a massive role in terms of helping improve my uh, mental health because it also improved my quality of life um and i also think i think i i became a man of habit and yeah. i think that really helped just having good sort of like by setting up my days in a more sort of regiment following habits i was able to see what worked what kept me productive what kept me feeling good and stick to it and i mm -hmm. think actually in a weird knock-on effect i became more almost like you know you'll find few people who are more sort of routine than me yeah but it's really helped me sort of progress in my work progress in the gym progress in sort of yeah my mental health and those habits just sort of fueled that it's amazing i think like it just leads me right really nicely into my next questions in regards to what are your sort of three daily habits that have helped you to become the person you are today to position that you're in today what are those three daily habits that have helped you oh three um if you've got more fire them away no, I mean, no, no I but think like, three is whole, a good my, number my whole day is sort of <sighs> yeah but habituated, a something but... that you know you can actually say in regards to the habits that you do really really significant habits that you do on a day-to-day -day basis that have helped you that you feel that by, by actually listening to these habits on this podcast someone listening might be able to utilize these habits to help them propel them th th them to greatness and improve improving their lifestyle and life well i think it's quite hard to narrow it down but what i will say is i'm always um super the first thing i do when i wake up is usually well nowadays i take a probiotic first thing in the morning mm. um and then 10 15 minutes later i'll have a large glass of water and i think the simple like tacking that onto my morning thing just helps set me up 
the day right rather than immediately going to your phone or immediately grabbing the coffee. I think just those two basic things, I'm getting some good probiotics into my stomach and then, you know, just, you know I probably I'm not the best at keep drinking enough water. So starting the day by just, you know, drinking a large glass mm. usually sets me up better. And, you know, we know the benefits of water on your health, like cognitively, skin health, you know, digestive health. So just adding that straight into the beginning of the day sort of sets me up better for the rest of the day. I would say exercise is definitely like, you know, I train seven days a week. Now I make sure I follow, you know, a structured program. So it's not, I'm never run the risk of overtraining as it were, or t overtaxing my central nervous mm. system. Um, but I, I find that I feel so much better if there's some form of exercise in my day. Yeah. So it could just be a case of like, you know, if my muscles are sore or whatever, it could be a case of like more zone two work cardiovascular. But, um, you know, I will find that I, every day of the week, I will do some form of exercise. It could even just be a walk, but mm. it will be a walk with a purpose as yes, it were. Yes, an intention. Um, then I think the biggest one in terms of just overall health is having a, a, a set nighttime routine or a bedtime. Yes. So I think like sleep is such an undervalued sort of health mechanism or lever that we can pull um, and so developing a better nighttime routine to set me up to get you know hopefully seven to nine hours of sleep mm. has been such a benefit on my overall health in terms of you know mental health in terms of physical performance in terms of recovery you know the good sleep is indicative to so much longevity and mm. health that you know it can't be understated or undervalued so i think prioritizing you know habits whether it's you know i have a a, a a reminder in my phone that sets off like an hour before i need to go to bed to start unwinding so mm. that you know i'm not glued to a screen right up until bedtime so i'm not you know i dim the lights i have a hot shower you know things like that the sort of easy habits to stack but they're also such positive impacts on improving sleep yeah that's amazing i think they're very simple habits you know one obviously is just when you do the same thing consistently it makes life a lot easier so you know you obviously you take your probiotics in the morning you drink a large glass of water you prioritize and exercise and you make sure you get a sufficient amount of sleep they're not very difficult ones Simples. and if i think if someone was on a weight loss journey if they did those three things they'll definitely definitely notice the improvement in their actual overall health you know getting sufficient amount of hydration exercising moving more and making sure they're getting sufficient amount of rest which is really really good what do you think the journey has taught you on the path to being successful and being in the position that you're in today? I mean, the whole idea of this is talking about that winning mindset, consistently thinking of how can I be better? What do you think you've learned along the way? I think I've always learned to prioritize education. Mm. So um, obviously the diagnosis of Crohn's way back when sort of, sort of fanned the flames as it were to want to learn more. But I think that's always continued throughout. And I think, you know, it helps differentiate me from a lot of other people in the fitness space. As yes. I've done like pre and postnatal, I've done fertility, nutrition, I've done qualifications on sleep health, on sort of, you know, menopause, all these things like not only helps me understand the body better so I can help a wider range of people, but it's also, I think, differentiated me, but, you know, led me to progress in my, in my more career um so i think that sort of drive for education has always helped um further my career and i think a lot of people lose sight of that um and they look at the pound signs first yes. and i think you know whilst not a bad thing to focus on say like your marketing because obviously that helps get the message out there what you can left be left with is someone who you know what do they say all fart and no poo so like, <laughs> you know they're good at the marketing part so they get the clients in but what actually reaches the clients is not the best sort of service as it were the deliverables yeah exactly the deliverables. so like for someone like yourself who's obviously you know reached heights in the sort of fitness career as it were consistent but you're yeah. also always learning yeah I see, I see on your instagram you're always like you know you go over to the states or you go to like michael hearn and you're learning mm. and you're always you know we have conversations in the gym the whole time where we're picking each other's brains where it's not a case of i know everything it's a case of you know hearing other people's perspective other people's knowledge and 
you know enveloping it as it were yeah i mean i've always believed in staying forever students and i think the ability to learn is your ability to progress and if Love you don't that. if you don't if you don't learn and you don't come in as a student um how can you learn and the most important thing is learning is growth not just for you but also for the people that you're coaching and the people that you're around i look at the gym as a classroom the reason i look at the gym as a classroom is because i look at what people are doing and I might think like, well, that exercise, I would never use that, but that would be good for one of my clients. I would use that for one of my clients. Again, when we talk about nutrition, you know, you talk about your issues that you've had with Crohn's disease. A lot of people don't understand it. They, they, they don't suffer from it. They don't, it doesn't mm. affect them. A lot of people that are in the gym environment are only concerned about, what is it, looking good, feeling good, and you know maybe meeting a partner of their dream you know just they're not really focused about the the, the, the little things that really matter and mm. there's a lot of shit out there unfortunately <laughs> on social media i want to touch on your social media a little bit because you make me laugh with uh with your social media what has inspired you to your social media in regards to how you know you do a lot of research on the shit that's out there I, on social media <laughs> and you're like Welcome to the show. <laughs> you know, talk to me. Talk to me. Come on. So I think, well, I mean, I think an element stemmed from I was getting sent videos by clients and, and, and followers just being like, is this true? Where I think there's become a craze of the last two or three years of demonizing things. Mm. And then therefore people are getting so confused to what is healthy or what is good or how to do x y and z because what's put out into the mm. realm of social media is such confusing like sort of narratives so it's kind of like it stemmed from literally people sending me these videos so i was like rather than just explain it to one person why don't i make a video about this and mm. why this just isn't supported by the evidence and then you know the whole i mean it's it's not hard to find bad videos now i mean i get sent no. loads anyway but um if you go on if you scroll on instagram or whatever platform you're on for two minutes you'll probably see someone demonizing oats or saying why plants are bad you're like how has this how has this happened um it seems that the more we know now the more confused people are rather yeah. than the better the information that reaches the consumer so um yeah and it, it seemed to you know again i'm trying to obviously promote my book so it seems to help with the growth of my channel is actually these debunking myth mm. sort of uh, videos so i sort of you know again you've got to do what i guess resonates with the audience best and they enjoyed the videos so i just continued with them i think the videos are great i really enjoy them but one of my thing i always say to you regards to that is that simplify for those people out yes. there well i, I think, i've done that i, I think simpler simplifying the videos is something that something that will be a lot of people out there they want they want the simple information and they want it quick but and i see some of your videos and i it makes me chuckle inside because <laughs> i know you and i watched them myself from the beginning to the end and i'm like I, some of the stuff I'm just like this is so so fucking so not right like wow. how do people get away with saying so much shit on social media I definitely it's like actually, you know I, there should be Instagram police out there well that, I mean there should like I mean they really should they should yeah. I mean Instagram should do a better job of deleting misinformation Factual. yeah misinformation well. they do do it so you can if you scroll down any sort of biohackers page you'll see um posts that have subsequently been deleted because they are just incorrect mm. uh, factually unfortunately you know obviously it's a big realm to police yeah so a lot goes through the cracks um but i actually took i have taken your advice um, and i think it was very uh, sound advice because i used to struggle to get videos under five minutes because yeah. i would try and go in depth into the research and then sp explain every nuance and unfortunately people's you know um attention span attention span like is so small so <laughs> so it was kind of a case of you you said simplify it to then get to the point quicker and that's mm. actually worked wonders for me so um, i mean i've got you to thank for that no no I, like i said i want to see your success like i said the eagles don't fly with pigeons i want a flock <laughs> of eagles flying with me you know it's important that. that i want to see your success and simplicity is something that i've noticed that works really well on social media from my perspective when i'm trying to explain something mm. you know i don't use any posh words i just simplify things as much as i can but you know um you know i think you're you're what you're doing on your social media platforms are excellent 
uh, especially when it comes to the you know debunking things and simplifying things for the audience is very important uh, I, I think what you've got to try and do now is look at aspects of your self and start talking about you because people want yeah. to know you because i wasn't fully aware about your crohn's disease yeah you know I've... so people want to know the things that you've suffered with things that you've overcome the obstacles that you've faced and how you've overcome those obstacles to be the person you are today because you're a wealth of information but to me what i find more interesting and how i learn from people is the obstacles they they've come up, up against and how they've overcome it not the information they've read from a book because that's literally first hand yeah i i, I agree with I, I would caveat that and say like obviously anecdotal evidence is not necessarily the best so mm. someone could have overcome x y and z but it doesn't mean that the next person will actually benefit necessarily from that approach but mm. I, I i i do think you are 100 percent spot on it's it lends to like you well you also buy in like people buy relate in to, to, yeah relate, so relate, like, to to relate to you i think i struggle to talk about my crohn's disease more openly and yeah. i also don't want it to detri one i i think i always didn't want to be known as the guy with crohn's or the you know as someone who only deals with gut health because of his own sort of struggles as it were but imagine how powerful that could be no, for I, I a male or female out there that is suffering from Crohn's disease, that they feel like their life has come to an end, they're asking the same questions you're asking now, why me? And you come out with a post and you talk about your situation and how you're able to be this amazing guy, this knowledge of wealth of information. Not only have you helped yourself, but you're helping others along the way. I mean, that's just so powerful because relate to, being able to relate to someone to me, I always say people buy from people. Yeah, you know, not true. necessarily. Am I the best online coaches that have ever walked the planet? Maybe not. I don't think I am. But am I really good and passionate about my job? You know, do yeah, I have they a, buy into you know, what they're buying yeah, to yeah. me. You know, what I what I love, and I always say it's important that people want to know you for Chris, not necessarily all of the information that you're giving out. Because I just think, you know, your your wealth of knowledge. I see you've read so many books. You know, I always see you reading on your breaks. Mm. Whenever you have a moment, you're reading, you're reading, you're reading, you're reading. So your wealth of knowledge. Um, so that's very important from my perspective to you as an individual because I yeah. want to see you succeed. No, I, I I really appreciate that. And actually, now that you've said it, I am like kind of like, why haven't I, why haven't I spoken about it more? I think mm. there is an element of it's not. I would say it is insecurity, but it's it's. I, I think I've gone past there. I just I don't think I've thought about talking about it more purely because I think I was so sort of unwilling to accept the diagnosis back in the day that I didn't really want to talk about it. So then I think as I've just grown and matured throughout this journey, I think I've just sort of, I haven't picked up back on it, just purely not from a like actively trying to avoid it. Just, mm. I just haven't thought about it. So I well, think- For me, that's more powerful. Mm. I know what you say in regards to clinical evidence and what you read, but then, clinical evidence back to your own experience yeah no no, no. I, I i powerful. as i said like i powerful. think i think you're right powerful. i'm not disagreeing no you know but leads on to another nice little question you know how do you maintain the winning mindset you know for, for, you know especially with setbacks and failure how do you maintain the winning mindset when you come against setbacks and failure well i think i think um one of my good friends always talks about this um I think motivation is a finite resource, right? So mm. that's where discipline comes in. And I think because of, as we go back to like, I'm so routine and habituated as it were. So I'm so fueled by my habits that actually, if I have a flare up with my condition or something goes wrong, I just get back to what I do well. And that builds my confidence back up. And it keeps me, you know, always working you know for like furthering my goals so you can have anyone can have sort of dips in where they you know perform badly or they feel you know unmotivated or whatever but if the underlying sort of like structure of your day and your sort of you know what fuels you is set up correctly mm. you shouldn't ever fall too far off you know that trajectory of obviously trying to improve so you know i might you know you know i it's hard to always stay motivated with necessarily my training because i could have a you know a flare up and get sick and therefore my strength reduces mm. i could lose a bit of muscle mass 
but I'm, I, I, I don't then, when I'm, when I'm physically able to get back into the gym, I am, and I'm working back towards building that back up mm. because that's just who I am now. Um, rather than taking that sort of setback and taking it too personally and dwelling on it and ruminating in it, I'm trying to always then, you know, okay, we all have our cross to bear, as it were. Mm. How can I keep moving forwards? So, like, you know, over time, it's like with weight loss, right? It's never perfectly linear. You'll have, like, little bits where it goes up and then comes down, little bits where it goes up and comes down. But as long as the trajectory is correct. So mm. I always think in terms of work and business and life, as long as you're... Am I, you know, moving in the direction that where I see myself? Like, you know, whether that's a financial gain or whether that's a, a maybe a gain in sort of happiness or mental health mm. that's an interesting question you touched on there mm. that's an interesting um, you know what's been what that's would like you define success. as happiness did what I'd, I think happiness is like um, are you are you going to bed content at the end of the day are you doing like I think happiness looks different for different people but obviously you know I get to do what I love for a living yeah I you know are there things I want to do in my life? Yes, and I, most of the time I do them. Like, I have that. I guess there's an element of freedom within that. Yeah. I think, like, when people talk about money and happiness, there's only an extent where there's a, a certain level of money where it provides more freedom to do things. But beyond that, it's not necessarily, like, more money doesn't mean more happiness. Mm. So if you've reached that element where, like, you know what? Like, for me personally, it's... I love as I said, like learning things. So am I getting to learn things in my day-to-day -day life? Am I getting to help people? Mm -hmm. You know, again, so I think, as I said, happiness will look different for different people, but am I going to bed at the end of the day, you know, pleased with what I'm doing and, and you know, happy and content, oh, I can't say happy for happiness, <laughs> content mm -hmm. and like sort of fed as it were. I think like, you know, what does happiness look like for you? Well, happiness to me is waking up and doing the things that I love every day and making yeah, so people you're smile. excited. you're excited to start your day. Yeah. It's not like, oh, I've got to go to work or, oh, those in-laws need to sit, you know. Just waking up and every time, do you know what I'm thinking? I always do whenever I step on the ground when I wake up, I always say it's going to be a great day, you know, because I'm just happy to be alive because, you know, I'm 44 years old. I feel in the best shape of my life. I'm healthy. Mm. I'm able to do the things I love. I'm able to travel. I'm able to eat the foods that I want. All the choices that I make is all down to me. And I think there's there's different caveats to in it, within that. So like obviously financial freedom is one of them, right? Yes. For happiness. Then you've obviously got your health. So physically yeah. you're able to do what you want mm. and capable. So I think there's different things that will play into that. And then obviously like I guess family. Yeah. You know how rewarding like you know do you have kids or a dog or things that are like you know giving you like feedback in that regard so i yeah. think there's different facets that play into it but i think like that is a nice one in terms of like you wake up and you're motivated to just do the, the things day. That, do, yeah. just do the things that i love like for me it's not a hard i don't think life is hard enough for me as it is i think when you make life easy life is harder when you make life hard life is easy i think for me i always look at things and where i can improve mm. and how i can make my life a lot harder so life can be easier yeah i think i think i wake up at 5 a.m this is why people who like potentially like win the lottery aren't then like happy as it were because yeah. like what well, they get the financial freedom right but then they're not they're not driven for anything mm. you're obviously a very driven person who's like trying to you know win however many championships mm. or be the best you know in in your sphere but so you there's there's a drive fueling you and i think if people don't have that that's where a lot of like that you know negativity or unhappiness is mm. is found because obviously like you're motivated i like i love what i do i'm you know happy to like go to work as it were so i think like having a purpose and we see a lot of like I, whether it's like older people when they retire yeah. and they lose their purpose, how quickly their deteriorate. mental faculties deteriorate, but also, yeah, they're Physical. sort of, yeah. So it's kind of like having that purpose, I think is such a driving force for your, your happiness and who you are. Yeah, definitely. I couldn't agree with you more. You have to focus on what you really want. What's your purpose in life? Mm. What brings you joy? What brings you fulfillment? All of those things to me are easy questions to answer. And, you know, a lot of the stuff that brings me joy is being able to 
get up in the morning, go to the gym, start my day with exercise, eat the good food and my put the good things in my yeah. system, make people smile, engage with people, you know, on the, on the positive aspects of life, meaning that when you connect with people, you know, I always say each interaction you have with someone, you're either laying bricks or taking bricks away. Mm. So meaning people want to be around you or people just don't want to be around you. People think, you know, they make a, a society we judge people, unfortunately. You know, um, and however I look, I know I'm, I'm very judged very quickly before anyone actually speaks to me. But yeah. especially in the gym environment, they'll be like, oh my God, look at that big guy, look at that guy, he looks intimidating. <laughs> I better not go near him. I better not go and ask him how many more sets has he got. Yeah, not yeah. knowing that, you know, I'm probably the nicest guy you're going to meet in the gym. If you ask me how many more sets you've got, I've got, I'll probably say, just join in with me, mate. Yeah, you know, yeah. you well, know, just I, join in with I me. I know that. <laughs> you know, it's, to my detriment. <laughs> yeah, no, it's always the way. Like, you know, I think it's important, like, never judge a book by its cover. I mean, that's well, one of the things, one of the lessons that I've learned in life is I like, never judge a book by its cover. I always try my very best to make people laugh. I love being made to laugh myself, I, you know, and I think all of those things I contribute towards my happiness yeah. and towards my joy in life, you know, and I always think life is too short, you know, we're, I'm 44 years old now and if I live till I'm 80 or I live till I'm 90, you know, if I live till I'm 80, I've got another 36 years, if I live till I'm 90, I've got another 46 years on this planet, you know, it's if you like spend 50% of that, sort of. that sleeping, it's not long, is well, it? It's either the sort of like, um, it's not the years in your life, but the life in your years. That's it. Yeah. So it's kind of like, yeah, having that purpose and that fulfillment and that joy. Exactly um, that. I always uh, I struggle with people who are like, oh, this is boring or I'm bored. It's like, well, there's so many things you could be doing. Exactly. Like, I, and like the simple pleasures, if they're like lost on you. Like, yeah. I love reading, as you said. Like, so just having that little quiet time to just read a bit. Like, it, for me, it's so much pleasure, but like, people like i guess instagram and everything is like sort of sapping sort of like i think the the simple pleasures from people i think instagram is has a good thing and a, and a negative thing in the sense that it kind of saps a simple pleasure from people mm -hmm. but you know i know i'm guilty of it that i could be on instagram scrolling and i'll be there for like thinking i was there for like 10 minutes but i've been there for an hour yeah scrolling well, yeah, i know yeah. i'm guilty of it so sometimes like the simple thing like not picking up your phone first thing in the morning um, it's something that I've actually taught myself to do now. Yeah. So the first half an hour when I wake up, I don't touch my phone. Nice. And the only thing I touch my phone to do is to meditate. And I do that at half past. So I wake up, and I do all my sort of, my glass of water, my Celtic sea salt. You know, nice. I take my creatine in the morning, you know, and after I've drunk my water, with my Celtic sea salt and creatine mixed in, then I have my coffee. Then when I'm sitting down making my coffee, this is where I talk about habit stacking. So my mm -hmm. habit stacking is, the minute that I make my coffee is when I then grab my phone to meditate. And before I look at any messages from anyone, I'm meditating for 10 minutes. Is that a guided headspace, meditation? Yeah, headspace or? app, yeah. which is really, really good. Very simple to use. Literally just, I stick on my earphones. I don't even nice. have to think about it. And I just follow the instructions that I've been given. So it's having that sort of routine in the morning, yeah. which is very, very important. And, you know, I think for me, it's important to have a routine because when you don't have a routine, you're just pissing into the wind and that shit comes back at you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no one needs that. You know, no one needs piss coming back yeah. in their face. You but know? like, I think that's like, it, you touched on habit stacking is such a simple way of developing, I guess, better sort of habits over time that even little things like, you know, just because you add your creatine there, we know from the literature it doesn't really matter too much when, when you, you take, take it, it yeah. as long as you take it yeah. so stacking it onto something that you always do means you're going to always do it and yeah. therefore you're going to be consistent mm. and we know consistency is key when it comes to pretty much most things in life you know whether it's you know achieving the progress in within your like physically or mentally like yeah. consistency so like you know the fact that you take your creatine on attached to like your sort of um morning your morning routine. water like is done easy yeah. i think I, I like for me the, the two best times to take creatine is obviously if you remember to take it yeah whenever, <laughs> that's it and whenever you can yeah i <laughs> generally the best time i think i have mine with breakfast because i make a shake yeah and it just like again because i'm making a shake i know i put it in so then it's like well i, I remember you forget about it yeah you know and that's it and you've taken it and that's yeah. something with people a lot of people like you talk about information and we're in an information 
overload era because mm. you know I, the only example I can give is when I was training and I started training in summer 1992 there was no Instagram there was no Facebook there was no YouTube it was just a local guy at the local gym and the magazine that you buy called Flex yeah. and Men's Health to pick up those magazines and to look at the pictures and look at the workouts that are in there and try and mimic hopefully the guy they've put in there has a, an amazing physique being like right I want to look like that guy like, 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 like that guy so I'm going to do the exercise that's inside those magazine this is when you get your information and do your research how deep do you go and where do you find your information from when you say like I, 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 I mean I grew up in a similar time to you <laughs> I'm only a little bit younger yeah. um, but so I mean it was a similar state where I think that is almost a blessing in some ways where it was sort of like all right the the knowledge wasn't so in depth but you got the basics right and you stuck with it exactly where we've overcomplicated the fuck out of everything now and everyone's a bit like what well, is this optimum or like uh, how many sets or how many like muscle groups and it's like well it's just you know you're overcomplicating it so like in terms of when i debunk videos on 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 instagram like posts as it were i have to do deep dives because i've got to you know show that this is factually incorrect to yeah. what the person's saying so that means like you know i'll spend a good hour or two reading me reading the sort of studies that come up on pubmed uh, predominantly pubmed google scholar maybe um but um you know because you've also quite often people will just cite a study but they haven't fully read it or they've only read the abstract and it doesn't fully show what the actual research says mm. um so you know it, i i posted today about someone was saying like polyester uh, sh like uh, underwear reduces your testosterone <laughs> he pulled up a, a study so i had to read the full study the full study is quite long it takes like you know a good 30 minutes to an hour just to read the study because i then want to be able to say with confidence what the study actually says mm. so i mean it takes 20 seconds for people to put out misinformation it yeah. takes a lot of time to actually sort of make sure you sort of debunk it as it were yeah or you know factually what the evidence actually says it's interesting i think like for me that's interesting information that's been put out there that people put out and how they get their information and the way you source your information you go through the factual information gathering before and it's like each video you put out could take you an hour's research oh easily easily yeah. um when i was doing my qualifications to become a clinical nutritionist they actually had a, a whole module in terms of the sort of you have this sort of pyramid of of research to what is like the most sort of you know the best type of study all the way down to the like the lowest quality study so you've mm. got like sort of meta-analysis and systematic reviews at the top mm. and then you've got sort of case studies sort of at the bottom um so you know they they taught me not only what the best type of you know studies were to look at but also then how to interpret the studies what they meant mm. um, how to sort of understand the different types of research and that was actually a big part of me gaining confidence in knowing that what I was putting out onto sort of social media or to my clients was what the empirical evidence said rather than just sort of what I thought it said or at least what you know my bias were because yeah. we're quite often governed by like our internal biases mm. so it was kind of like I don't really have a pony in this race in terms of I don't promote a particular diet I don't promote a particular sort of like you have to eat this or you have to do that so I'm not really pushing an agenda when I am on social media I'm just mm. trying to give you factually what the evidence says so you know it might come out one day that uh, sort of like maybe artificial sweeteners are bad for gut health but what i say right now is that's not supported by the evidence that's out there mm. so i will just say that if it later come transpires in five ten years when enough research is done that they do then i will happily say they do mm. i i don't mind i'm not like it's not proving me wrong it's just saying what the evidence is so at this moment in time it's kind of like I'm sure I'll have biases somewhere that I'm not sh aware of. Like I don't like the carnivore diet because mm. I think because <laughs> I, think, I think it's stupid. But um, factually and from the research, I am backed up by that. So you know, I like to sort of think that I'm as neutral as you can be in the nutritional space, yeah. where I don't really care what 
the evidence says. I just, what is the evidence? Yeah, what's yeah. factual? Yeah, what's factual, what's factual? Not like what's my internal belief? Yeah, yeah. that's interesting. Though. I think that's very important as well. The factual evidence that you put out for people to actually take on board, you know, and actually implement is very important. So, leads me on to my next question. Who's been your biggest influence in personally and also in 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 um, your sort of path to greatness and to be better as a clinical nutritionist? So I think in professional life, person and professional life. I'll say I'll say in person. Yeah. The um, the sort of my supervisor on my sort of clinical nutritional qualification yeah. so um there's two people um maurice and alex who um head up the research section of that division and they were amazing they sort of mm. uh, were always on hand to sort of help me through what like understand what the you know the module was saying or if i had any questions and they also just i really loved how they thought about things and how they sort of like went in depth like to an extra degree in the knowledge yeah so i think they were a big part of my my learning um in terms of like online um i think people like lane norton i think people like dr peter atia uh dr mike isratel i think they are great sources of good quality information again evidence-based mm. so they don't mind saying that they were wrong but what they're saying is this is what the evidence says yeah. so they have that sort of fairly neutral approach um so they they i think they've been a good source of like at least in this information social media sort of world mm. um, and I, I recommended that outlet book to you from yes, Dr. Peter yes. here so like i think they've been a great source of like just helping me you know like when everyone was started to shit on seed oils yeah i read the research and was like i really don't understand where this is coming from but to then see them do videos and them do articles on it sort of backed up like i'm i have understood what the research is saying mm. like i came to the right conclusion based off of the conclusions they have then come off of yeah so i think that gave me confidence as well um i think in personal life obviously my parents have always been super supportive like they don't really understand nutrition but they've been supportive mm. in terms of my career choice um and you know they were there when i was you know ill i guess and down on in terms of mental health so they've been super supportive there and i think actually because i've been at one london since it opened um i think that gym and um, the owner of the gym and actually a lot of people like because we've been a hot spot for like um i think influencers but like actually it's given me a lot of contacts who are amazing people in the fitness world and yeah. like yourself like mm. i actually met you years back like in i think whiskey miss yeah um, <laughs> back, back in, in my party back in those days but, um <laughs> with waz with Waz, that's yeah. where I met you from as well. Um, who's now a fitness person as yeah. well. Um, we all moved out of that sphere. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it's, I think that's actually provided a, a great place where I've met people like yourself and been able to speak to like people like Sam Peeps who are like, you know, well informed in terms of exercise biomechanics. So mm. areas outside of, I would say, my wheelhouse mm. and then sort of, you know, bounce ideas off of. Um, and then obviously, like, you know, I think i think those you know that that environment has helped me you know just again f you know f like tune my sort of my repertoire as it were i think it's important the, the environment you surround yourself or the people you surround yourself the environment you put yourself in is very important 100 um but this is one of the reasons why i'd rather train up train in a, in a more expensive gym then go and train at somewhere like Pure Gym or the, the gym group and pay like 20, 30 quid a month to train because, not because I want to be like, oh, I'm a gym snob, which I am really, but I want to, the people, the sort of people that go to those sort of places are going to be a different clientele. And the, the environment that you're going to be in and the people that you're going to surround yourself with are going to be different from those that are going into some 30, 40 quid a month gym, no disrespect to that. No. Uh, just to stay fit I'm not saying you shouldn't use a 20 30 pound a month gym by the way I think if you get yourself in any gym you can afford to pay for uh, but like think of how invaluable it's been with your sort of trips to America training with like the godfather of bodybuilding like yeah. Charles Glass or whatever like putting yourself in those situations of environments where 
it's like-minded people who are at the sort of height of their craft mm. is invaluable and being at a you know a, a great gym where a lot of people come through the doors who are you know well known in the fitness industry mm. has you know helped me I guess you know gain connections and potentially learn like as I said like always eager to you know listen to these people and just connect with them on social media just yeah. to like then follow and you know again see you know their sort of their take on things like I follow you and when you break down an exercise I can then like go like okay I might not have looked at it from that perspective mm. but you know again because I've made that connection I've then had a chance to you know absorb information I might not have come in contact with yeah I keep everything simple <laughs> <laughs> no but like simple is the it best is like when it comes to exercises when people try and break things down and they go uh, over complicate and I can understand the biomechanic and muscles you're trying to work the most important thing that you need to take into consideration especially when, when it comes to exercise for me anyway I think of range of movement and tempo two things that you need to take into consideration am I getting the good tempo from this and am I doing this in the correct range of movement is the weight that I've selected too heavy that's the third thing you could take into consideration because there's right. a lot of people that don't understand that your muscle stimulation don't necessarily come from you have to lift heavier weight if you're not getting a range of movement nor yeah, you're going 100%. in the right tempo it's all 100%. about time and attention it's simple yeah. and I think like also like I think there was a, a period where people were trying to stress too much like optimal but then actually what's optimal for one person is not necessarily optimal for another so i think like this desire to chase optimal as it were actually can defeat the point like the yeah. basics work like and as you said going through that full range of movement you know controlling that range of movement you know you can't beat that you can't like if i always think this like if i was to and this is what like to be honest i don't i i try and specialize my instagram more on sort of nutrition rather than exercise but i feel like if i was to post actually how i train it would be boring as fuck because it would be like here's another squat mm. here's another pull up like you know again it's not like i i feel like instagram is obviously clickbaity so you yeah. get like combination exercises and you're like what you know you got clients going like why do i never do stuff like that i'm like because mm. that's not very good like no. if if your reason to be in the gym is to progress in terms of body composition and to you know max out muscle hypertrophy as it were which predominantly should be like most people's goal in terms of longevity obviously yeah. you want your cardiovascular system worked as well but in terms of like um you know optimizing hyper hypertrophy a combination exercise is never going to be optimal no because i can squat more than i can press so yeah. doing a thrust is not actually going to translate to better muscle growth as no. it were. so it's kind of like you've always got to look at like you know the basics the basics work and mm. you know it's kind of like if you take out the clickbaitness it's kind of like yeah and that's why like your videos are breaking down an exercise it's just like it's what people need to see to be honest with you because it's like well how many people are doing it wrong and then how many people are trying to be like well should i not be doing this crazy exercise you're like no look i'm five-time world champ like i do a fucking you know i do i do this <laughs> i this do the basics what, what it works. i like, do the basics and i do it know, really really well yeah. You know, you touch on longevity. I'm very passionate about that. So if someone like, you know, obviously I'm in my 40s, you're in the late 30s, right? Mm. You know, so when we look at longevity, what are the three key factors that we need to take into consideration when it comes to longevity? Hmm. Um, I would say muscle mass is one of the biggest predictors of like um, mortality, as it were. So you want to make sure you build as much muscle as you can and then maintain it mm. later in your years because that's also going to be a sort of good proxy measure for sort of how active you can be later on in life yeah obviously if you're starting at a low muscular point and we know like you know the gradual decline in muscle mass in your later years if you're starting at a very low point you're going to end up like unable to get out of a chair yeah and we know that like you know if you look at like at least my grandparents they were quite uh, physically incapable in their final when the marginal decade as it were mm. their last 10 years of their life so i think building that foundation and maintaining it as much as you can will not only help you metabolically sort of like again muscle is you know again a better predictor for metabolic health so mm. but also 
keeping you active. Um, I would say sleep. Again, sleep just is fundamental to health. So prioritizing sleep as best you can, uh, whether that's sort of making sure you're sort of, you know, it, you know, helps promote like better cognitive function later in life. So you, you know, we know that impaired sleep is going to you know put you at a better risk of things like dementia and alzheimer's so i think you know prioritizing sleep um i mean i would say diet and then like you know cardiovascular health as it were so diet in terms of remaining a healthy weight mm. so making sure you stay you know a healthy weight as it were um prioritizing fiber we know that you know for every 10 gram increase you have a 10 percent reduction in um all-cause mortality so you want to be making sure you have you know a good amount of fiber in your diet i'd say the average gem pop that's probably 25 to 30 grams um we know from research that a better variety of it mm. leads to better gut health so yeah. again improving general health markers there and sort of blood glucose control so if you're worried about sort of i guess insulin and stuff like that um i would limit the amount of saturated fats um despite what carnivores think um or don't think um we know that a greater amount of saturated fat does lead to a sort of increase in ldlc or apob which is directly linked to um, atherosclerosis so you want to you know i'm not saying you can't eat saturated fat i'm saying limit it to like 10 to 20 percent of your fat intake um and then you do want to you know don't go crazy on the sugar because you want to keep your blood triglycerides down so if you're doing that for diet oh like high amounts of omega-3 good amount of protein obviously uh, to maintain muscle mass um then you know we know that again cardiovascular health is a great predictor of longevity so mm -hmm. making sure i think peter atia says it well it's sort of like you have a sort of it's a triangle right of cardiovascular health and if you've got zone two at the bottom which is essentially like your longer steady state exercise yeah. so you could have a conversation but semi struggle to have a conversation that's sort of your zone two work that wants you want that to make up about 80 percent of your training because you want a big base mm. if you only did a tiny amount you'd only have a like a, a, a small base at the bottom and um, then you look at zone five work which is more your sort of harder in you know vo2 max or yeah. promoting vo2 max so again that's sort of a shorter duration so between three to eight minutes yeah. of your highest intensity that you can hold for that amount of time and then repeat maybe four times so you do four by four as mm. it were but so you know 80 percent zone two work 20 percent zone five work again you've got that nice base to keep you more cardiovascularly healthy um into your later years and again that will also help with like metabolic health like you know all these like sort of health markers and mm. i know you do like health testing with your clients online yeah, right so yeah so i think it, again you're trying to do everything to from a holistic point of view to mm. help you know the biomarkers of health as it were yeah i think that's what i look at i think an holistic health approach is so important you know rather than because people when they come specifically someone like myself they want the result first you know they put the result first and for me it's about you know when we look at people we work with we look at longevity as one of our priority mm. you know, being able to do the things we do now into into our 50s 60s 70s you know and i want to know what are the key from your perspective what what defines that and i think longevity is very important and it's something i'm very passionate about as a 44 year old man yeah and i think like a lot of the biggest levers you can pull for your health are ones that you can pull yourself so yes. it's like sleep exercise resistance training mm -hmm. sort of like maintaining a healthy weight in terms of diet there are things that i'm, I'm sh like you i know you do with your clients in terms of like hrt for women yeah. uh, in their later years or i guess trt for men yeah um again that sort of plays into maintaining muscle mass maintaining like well i mean estrogen has a massive impact on like loads of health impacts for like women as it were so mm. you know i think it plays a big role in long longevity for women assuming they don't have any contraindications to why they can't take it and there are a small well a relatively small group of women who just um because of certain health markers can't but um i do think like obviously that element is you know where you get like you know people like yourself who can put you in touch with the right specialists to make sure that side of things like mm. from a pharma pharmacological 
perspective is taken care of mm. but what we can do as coaches is like you know set up the basics right where we are optimizing sleep diet training to then they have such big you know like impacts on your health you don't need to turn to you know med medicine first i think we want to have a sort of holistic approach first mm -hmm. and then you know i guess like intervention i think it's important yeah. uh, definitely we know you know testosterone level i did my testosterone test the other day i'm at 615 and i'm so surprised that the the minimum the the, the normal average for a male my age between the ages i think of 36 to 41 than that, right? it's like between like 46 and 86 or something i mean it's the, like ridiculous the testosterone the problem with the testosterone ranges is, is it's quite a wide range so what could be optimal for you could look like low for me or yeah. high for me so it's kind of it's quite a complicated one but again like a lot of your health uh, markers will have an immediate impact on your like testosterone so yes. making sure you are resistance training mm -hmm. sleeping well will all promote like better levels of testosterone in mm -hmm. general um i think it's become quite a clickbaity thing on instagram where it's like oh this negatively impacts your testosterone or this you know and it's kind of like i think it's quite a it's an fear-mongering thing that you know again like if you're unknowledgeable in the area you could buy into yeah, like again 100%. like you know seed oils are impacting your testosterone i would you know if i didn't know better i would be like oh fuck, what mm. does that mean like you know maybe i should avoid those like i remember the whole like what was it soy back in the mm. day everyone was like you gotta avoid soy it's yeah, a you, you bitch tits boobs. or whatever yeah, like, what? exactly <laughs> i mean this is completely debunked in the yeah. research like phytoestrogens don't suddenly raise your estrogen levels like to the no. point where you're like oh fuck i'm impotent now like no it, no it just doesn't work like that it's crazy so what does the winning mindset actually mean to you how do you define the winning mindset because obviously you've come up up against a lot of obstacles in your life to be the person you are today um so how, how do you define the winning mindset well i like this quote from um sean covey i believe he wrote the seven habits of highly effective people or whatever. Mm. Um, and it was we become what we repeatedly do yes. and I think that is for me sort of sums up what I think I has helped has helped me sort of excel in what I do and that's just habit and having my you know daily life more structured and set up in a manner that sort of promotes health promotes sort of longevity but also furtherment of career and and education as it were so I think we become what we repeatedly do sort of sums that up for me so yeah. i think that's for me the winning mindset um but i also think what we touched on in terms of having a sort of having well goals but also having a purpose i think is yeah. is beautifully ties into that winning mindset because I, th I think if you lose that you lose a sense of like what's driving you and that immediately <laughs> is not winning right yeah, you got to have a purpose because purpose gives you fulfillment. Mm. You know, when you have a purpose, you know, in life, it gives you fulfillment, an element of fulfillment, you know, when you have a purpose in life. Mm. And it's important that you have that purpose to be able to drive forward to the destination you want to go to. Yeah. And we can't have your book sitting here on the table without talking about your great book that you wrote. Um, you know, it leads me to a really good question. What are the three books that you've read that have inspired you to, re to write this? And also, what are the three quotes that you've read that inspires you? And would you like to read a chapter from that? Or would you like to read a paragraph from that? Um, you know, what's your favorite chapter in that paragraph from that book? Wow. Um, to be honest, like, I always wanted to write a book. Um, I started a, a newsletter, I think it was pre-COVID. Mm. Um, and I think that just garnered my love uh, interest of um, writing. Um, and it, it, it was a better format or uh, modality to be able to create long long form content mm. in a sort of world i guess that's predominantly driven by short short form short content, form content. Mm. Uh, but i always find it hard to you know weight loss is very simple you could just say calories in calories out kind mm. of thing and that kind of sums up a large part of it yes but actually when you want to like get into all the confusion and the nuances i was like 
a 90 second reel on instagram just doesn't do that for me no. um and it was kind of like you know i wanted to create something that you know for people who actually want to understand the problem and get them help themselves out of it maybe can't afford personal training or online coaching or just just want to learn more then this was you know a book that you know even a lot of personal trainers have bought because it can help them understand their clientele better yes. so um I think that was the purpose of, and that's why it's called simply confusing or confusingly simple the weight loss equation because it's kind of a very simple topic has become very sort of confused mm -hmm. um i think three books that helped me write it um well i mean the seven habits of highly efficient i, I forget the name of it but that was such a great book in terms of like the mindset mm -hmm. i think bio lane's book fat loss forever was a great sort of way to approach writing about weight loss in terms of how to section it out um and i think atomic habits you just like i mean come on if you haven't yeah. read that book like yeah, ever, it. like I it's such a good like, read almost three times yeah a year. it's such a good read but it's also it's a great way of sort of maybe creating more actionable steps yeah, so yeah. i wrote at the end of this uh, sort of actionable points that people could uh, plan out in terms of each section so whether it's sleep whether it's diet whether it's mindset um, and I think you know Atomic Habits was a good way of sort of going like what's a better way of structuring it and making more bite size for people to be able to apply to themselves yes because you could give them all the science but yeah at the end of the day they're Simplicities. like Simplicities. how, do, how like, do I apply it yeah how do I apply application it? So, is key um I mean the quote on the back for me is sort of set, sums it up there's um, I can swear on this program. Of course right? you can. If we as a species could eat intuitively, this book would not exist, and I would probably be writing a satirical piece on bringing up my children as Z, Z, or Zem. The truth is, our intuition when it comes to eating probably died out at the same time that common sense did. And this probably died in the mesmeric blaze of woke politics, heavily processed food alternatives, TikTok dance videos, and mumble rap. <laughs> so it's kind of like, it is a bit of a satirical piece, but yeah. again, it's, I write it how I talk, so I didn't want to make it too textbook. I yeah. didn't want to make it too like, you know, I quote all the studies in the back so there's a long sort of study sort of thing if you want to, to read the yeah, PubMed articles. Deep. But again, I, you know, as if you follow me on social media, you know, I have a bit of a foul language. Um, I don't you sort of beat around the bush. So the idea was to write it how I talk so that it it's for, you know, people who want to learn more, but they also want to laugh at the same time and yeah. sort of, you know, have a giggle. And it is on Audible now. So if you like my very monotone voice, it's available in my monotone voice. Amazing. Amazing. I think I'm going to get myself a copy of that on Audible and listen to it. Um, because I listen to a lot of books uh, whenever I'm in the car or doing cardio to just kill time. So I definitely will be getting well, that. I do, yeah, I, I do haven't, think. I haven't picked it up yet, but you know, since you gave it to me, so I'll definitely be getting it on Audible. It'll be a lot easier for me to listen to because I've got to kick, kill like almost <laughs> 45 minutes to an hour on the cardio, cardio piece yeah, of yeah. equipment every single day. So why not, why is one not listen to a book while I'm doing so? Um, what about quotes? You mentioned a couple of quotes earlier, but what about quotes that you think that was really inspired you and propel you to you know be successful and be you know be able to write a book and have an amazing successful business in your personal training business and obviously coaching clients online as well well again i think that that, that sean Kobe one beautifully always i think it's in the book as well illustrates how i feel about like we are what we 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 become what we repeatedly do, do. so yeah. it's kind of like again that's that falls into every facet of whatever you're doing so it's like you know your your nutrition you know you are what you eat kind of thing mm. if you are eating a terrible diet you're not gonna you're not gonna achieve your body goals mm. or or health goals for that matter again like it's sort of like you know if you're half assing your training yes all right the simple fact that you got to the gym probably giving you some benefits but could you are you doing as much as you really can with the yeah. time that you're given so again like it's kind of we are what we we become what we repeatedly do really sells me in the sense of like you know if you're not happy with where you're at like are you doing 
what you need to in order to achieve it and i think most people would look at themselves and go i probably could do more in yeah whether it's this facet or this facet mm. um you know it doesn't have to be super like you don't have to be david goggins and running you know ultra marathon after ultra marathon but you need to be doing more than what you currently are if you're not making the progress you want so yeah it's important that people understand that a lot of people want the shortcut they want the easy pill yeah. you know like I always say the, all the treasures that you've always wanted are in the, in the cave that you did not wish to enter yeah. so you've got to push yourself and really go beyond your believed capability and your limits but you know it's important it's very important what coping strategies do you have when it comes to setbacks and how do you really move forward to maintain that winning mindset well, I think one of the things I learned from, um, I think when I was researching the sort of mindset stuff for the book, actually, was the simple fact of um, if you have a setback, get back to doing the simple things that you know you are good at or you can do, because mm. that will help build your confidence back up. Mm. Um, so I think that's quite a great one in terms of just, you know, get back to doing what you know you're good at so therefore you can garner that confidence back up before you you know potentially put yourself in uncharted territories yeah um i think you've got to i think you know the the saying of like get uncomfortable get comfortable being uncomfortable i think there is a point where there's a lot of growth outside of your comfort zone and the knowledge of that can help you at least help push you to you know try something new like mm. if anyone's like you ever speak to someone who's you know not started their sort of resistance training program but they you know they hear the benefits they know they should mm. but the gym's a big scary place yeah you know so it's kind of like you know again breaking it down into maybe small goals incremental goals like maybe just signing up maybe then you know booking in an induction or something like that but making sure you know if you if you only live in that sort of comfort zone you know what are you really gonna achieve so i think like again it comes back to asking yourself what what, what are you after like yeah you, you know if you're happy then maybe you can you know keep ticking over but mm. most people aren't happy so it's like you've got to get out of that comfort zone in order to sort of you know propel yourself forwards like i think we've all done it like i white collar box for a while i know you were a, mm. a boxer back in the day but just putting yourself in a ring like you know oh my god like yeah i'm not saying people need to do that to become successful god no but you know i did that i had no i didn't need to but i thought like let's put myself out in out of my comfort zone try a new skill you know get beaten up but <laughs> you know it's kind of like you know i did a bodybuilding show back in the day i remember again, you doing you know, pure elite of, wasn't it yeah yeah, yeah and pure miami, elite, pro. miami pro uh but again that was kind of like you know i think there's nothing more nerve-wracking than standing on stage in front of a couple of hundred people in your fucking speedo mm, like again it but it was such a rewarding process like again like i think you've got to take those chances and get out of your comfort zone and also like you know the simple fact that because i knew i was going to be on stage meant i was so much more militant and driven in my diet in my training that actually you know it, it taught me a lot about just myself and yeah. like you know i think like they do say that about bodybuilding in terms of well okay it might be quite a selfish sport but it's a very like you need that mental resilience you to do. be able to like yeah. put yourself in that sort of you know very low calorie where you're sort of you know low calories but you're still having to do loads of cardio mm. you, you know again it's kind of like it's not a it's not a modality for the weak minded so no, definitely not i think it's important that you people understand that that you know when you do something you have to propel yourself even further forward with less fuel it's a lot harder yeah. <laughs> i remember just like and it's 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 actually like it taught me a lot because when i when i was then researching like again the the sort of complexities of weight loss and understanding why people fail and why why weight loss stalls and stuff like that and the sort of defense mechanisms that are within the body mm. i was like reading the research and i was like i literally experienced that when i was dieting for yeah. my show like it was kind of like the sort of like 
my your body fights against that sort of more weight loss so it like then stops you moving as much and i was like i remember being on low calories and being like i can't move yeah like, just like the act of getting up the was energy. hard because my body was saying like yeah. hey we're not getting enough calories and you don't have much body fat anymore let's just chill not move <laughs> yeah no i get it honestly that's how i feel most of the time towards the end of the day you know my day comes to a close and i'm not eating as much my calories low it's like it's more of an effort even just to have a conversation sometimes yeah you just speak I mean? slower it's harder but like i've got to say this uh, like you know in credit to you because i i've known you for what, like six or seven years now and i've seen you prep for shows mm. never you never lose the smile you never lose that sort of um energy yeah even when clearly like maybe behind the scenes that you're fucking knackered it doesn't show and i i respect there because i was a miserable twat when i was that level of emaciated i i think thank you very much for that compliment by the way i think it's important that you know i put myself in this environment you know i choose to live my life this way yeah. and like i always say the choices that you make is your decisions so and i think i do everything with a smile on my face because again i'm doing the things that i love like look you know i'm earning money from being an online coach helping people first and foremost around the world and you know changing lives and i'm so proud of what we're doing because you know we're not just an online coach that gives you a training program and and a diet plan you know i've got clients all over the world i've got clients flying in from russia i've got flying flying in from amsterdam i've got clients that i go and see in dubai people that you know we have we have a connection with obviously thanks to michael herman with titan medical mm. so anyone in the us we can get their blood work done we get a review we get a food allergy test done we do everything so we can promote longevity that's what i'm passionate about mm. i mean for me longevity efficiency the scientific rationale that goes beyond what we do beats everything the result is the last is all byproduct of what we do and that's yeah. what's important is that you've got to understand that i'm so so passionate about longevity you know and i have a purpose to be passionate about longevity because of myself as a selfish purpose i'm not going to lie because i want to find out as much information as i can so i can live longer and i can be doing the things that i'm doing now into my 50s and i want to pass that knowledge on to my our clients and make sure they're doing the same thing in their 30s as they are doing in their 40s and their 50s and i wish i started this journey a lot sooner than i did but it's never too late um you know it's important that you understand that um so can i can i ask you then what's that so because you've been doing this for longer than me yeah um if you could go back in time say to like 20 year old wally yeah like what are the what are the biggest like say two or three biggest things that you would do differently than when you first started your bodybuilding world oh that's such an interesting question i mean like obviously for me like what would i do differently i'll probably read more okay you know i definitely would read more do more research rather than a lot of the i don't like using the terminology bro science you know but you know because you know it's not really such a thing but you know people that haven't really done yeah, things yeah. not really done much research i'll probably do more research you know than what i did in my early 20s and i probably would have traveled more to train with you know people like charles glass with the things that i'm doing now in in my sort of early 40s late 30s and early yeah. 40s that things that i'm doing like going to america i'll be in america in la at the end of this month you know i've really booked my 10 session with charles you nice. know before i go and he's, he's not cheap he's like three thousand three thousand dollars for 10 sessions but you know things like that you know but to me that three thousand dollars is worth the investment oh, yeah, yeah. you know it's worth his weight in gold so i would have traveled more to train with the likes of you know charles glass mr michael hearn um I would have, uh, surrounding yourself with like yeah the exactly, right people yeah. rather than you know spending the time partying and tracing girls <laughs> <laughs> that's, what, Sundays, that's what that's <laughs> what i used to do i was the party animal you know i used to love going out to the west end in my but 20s. again like i guess like in some ways I guess there's a time and a place for that and it's actually like all right it's not sustainable in the long term but mm. i think you know it's nice to like to have i always think back because like pre like because i don't really drink mm. really ever like maybe once or twice a year mm. but i look back fondly on stupid drunken mistakes because mm. that was a younger time in my life that was kind of like a there's a there's a place for that almost like yeah. you, you can't be an old man in your 20s like or you shouldn't be because then no. you miss out on some of the you know the i guess the like life experience yeah i couldn't agree with you more because like it doesn't phase me like you know like you know when you have people 
like my age now going to have beef I look down on them yeah I'm like, no what I are do you doing? judge that a little you know I'm like what are you doing these are the sort of things I did in my 20s and yeah. 30s that sort of holiday doesn't interest me anymore yeah. um, even going to nightclubs I had several friends that were in nightclubs oh, this weekend no. and uh, to me it's just not my that scene anymore on me you know it's lost on me ago, as well yeah. so it's like the greatest thing that I learned from that is I don't feel like I've got any itches to scratch in yeah. my late 40s yeah. like you know with going out to clubs getting tables going to like when i go on holiday these days when i go to dubai i'm literally living a healthy life i'm yeah, waking up in yeah. the morning i'm having my breakfast i'm doing my cardio i'm having my breakfast you know i'm training in the afternoon i'm catching up with people i'm not going to nightclubs i'm not chasing girls i'm not chasing skirt because those things they're, they're, they're not they don't really phase me anymore so for me and that healthy life uh, is uh, what you enjoy as well. yeah a lot yeah. of the stuff that i do now is the things that i enjoy so the 20 year old version of myself if i can go back we probably would have done more reading more traveling to mm. train with people like the likes of yeah. charles glass and michael O'Hearn, um and also making sure that i actually pass that knowledge that i'm learning on because i was doing pt but i was doing pt on a very low level yeah. where you know how it was back well, you then. think how much your training has has, has sort evolved, of, has evolved. Yeah. like it's crazy from yeah. like even like five years ago to that's like what, what i'm like i give my clients now i'm like yeah Fuck. exactly like, you know i almost feel bad for my I, clients I feel bad. 10 years ago i feel bad i'm like you know so basics but now obviously now knowing the knowledge that we have mm -hmm. it's a, those things i would definitely have done definitely have done so but that's why I'm, i i remain forever student but I so think it's important but like one tr like just for you specifically mm. just because i think it's interesting because we always talk one training thing that you've completely like changed your mind on like whether it's like oh i used to like love partials or or drop sets or like i used to think the kickback was the best or like uh, one training element one training one thing training element. this is like... a, true to god like i'm not gonna lie yeah. back squat is my favorite exercise oh, like I, yeah i agree with that well it's my favorite exercise yeah. and i used to always but you say don't do it very often though. but listen i used to always say you can't build your legs without doing back squat but guess what you can build your legs without doing mm. back squat and it's my favorite exercise but is the the exercise with the highest risk of injury for me mm. as an individual because of you can the, go so heavy you can go because i go so heavy with it uh, and now that i've actually switched it over to hack squat mm. i'm getting you know a better aesthetic look for my legs overall uh, than i was when i was actually doing back squat so what i would say is that the, that sort of uh, limited belief within my own head saying that you can't develop your legs without doing back squat ah, i have okay. to sack so that off so yeah, yeah so you still love a back squat but your belief that you couldn't grow your legs without, without doing, back doing squat, it uh, i'll sack that off because... i think that's a good point because obviously you but you've also got so like to a point where you're very strong so a back squat is very it's a much more systemically fatiguing exercise than maybe a hack squat where you're not having to i guess stabilize yourself so much yeah. so it's like less load on your erector muscles i guess so like mm. you can get more muscle hypertrophy for less like more reward from less cost as it were exactly we that say. Yeah. exactly that you'll get more reward for less risk of injury so i think for me mm. it's important but we could talk all day chris yeah, no, I and i think it's so, so important for me like just to wrap it up by saying you know where can people find you uh if they're looking for you where can they buy the, your book or listen to your book from so um the the paperback and the Kindle version are on Amazon. Um, yeah. Simply confusing or confusingly simple, the weight loss equation. Or you can type in my name, Christopher Barker. Um, otherwise, Audible. I think you can also, the Audible link is on Amazon as well because I think it's connected. But um, otherwise, Audible, you just type in the book's name or my name and it will come up. Um, otherwise, you'll find me on Instagram under the lifestyle clinic underscore CB. Um, I also... I have my own sort of like I have a podcast on uh, or newish podcast on um, Spotify, but it's just sort of me rambling about different topics. It's not nearly as um, conversational as something like Wally's Winning Mindset, um, but it's me sort of like I, I did one last week on seed oils, just because people keep asking me so much. So it's kind of like if you want to listen to someone talk about the research, there it is, just as another sort of free add-on, as it were. But otherwise, yeah, the book and, uh, you know, I have clients on a clinical nutrition program. So uh, that's my sort of spread. And if you can leave us 
with one specific outro to those out there that are suffering from Crohn's disease, that are on a fat loss journey, that are on a, uh, a nutritional improvement journey, what would that be? Just one. It would be to focus on the s small changes uh, and maintaining those changes over time. Like rather, don't try and do a big overhaul. Start making little differences that will amount to big change in the long run. So I think that is one of the most like sort of missed points. Everyone wants to go like, oh, I need to overhaul my life or I need mm. to make drastic changes. It's like, well, actually, if you make these little incremental changes that will compound over time to make big differences, then actually there's so much easier to stick to. Yeah. So you don't, you know, again, it's delayed gratification, but um, focus on the, the, the little things that, you know, we always talk about the path of least resistance being the you know the best sort of ch ch uh, choice um so getting someone to increase their step count you know if they're on a weight loss journey mm. or you know just interested in overall health it's such an easy thing to focus on but it can have such big health ramifications in the long run yeah and it's we're not asking for a lot i'm not asking you to like take chocolate out of your mm. life you know i'm just asking you to go from you know if you're normally hitting five thousand, can we get it to seven thousand next week then maybe eight the week after but it's again that over time the clients who i've got who have made the biggest changes in terms of like you know overall weight and yeah. have kept it off the underlying factor was that they just became more active through a step count Amazing. yes they trained well yes they were able to eventually improve their dietary practices but their step count just went Amazing. from like three or four thousand to like on average like 12 to 14 and then it became something they enjoyed they listened to a podcast like the winning mindset mm. and they, <laughs> they enjoyed that walk and they looked forward to that walk and it was just I haven't, you know, that's not asking someone to do a lot. No. But again, the compound interest of that change is huge. Amazing. Chris, thank you so much for coming on the well, Winning Mindset podcast. Guys, that's me out. I want to say big thank you to Chris for coming on the Winning Mindset podcast. Guys, if you want me to interview anyone specific, please drop the, in the comment box or message me. Share this podcast. The whole idea for us, us is to try and improve your life. Make sure you get all of the things that you want from life with the help of us improving the tools that we've utilized to get to where we are today. I use the word we because each of our guests are very successful, but the underlying issues, what I've always experienced here with all of our guests is they've faced obstacles along the way that they've overcome and you can see the obstacles they've faced and how they've overcome those obstacles and utilize the tools that they've utilized in their own life, in your own life to overcome those obstacles. Guys, remember, God bless you and let's all get swell like well. <laughs>